What's up, guys? We're back with episode five of the Rhythm and Rhymes podcast. Uh, I'm your host, AJ Hughes, and I am without my co-host, Antonio Hughes, yet again. And he's on vacation. I got pictures here for you. He's in the Bahamas. He'll be back next week, but we're still going to get through this episode. I'm going to do my best to run down everything that he mentioned to me and all the other topics I wanted to talk about. Actually, a lot of surprises in terms of the things that came out. I didn't think there was going to be this much drop in this week. I thought it was kind of an off week in terms of the drop, uh, the cycle that people are usually on dropping music. Um, I will say, though, I have some favorites on here and I have a lot of takes that I'm really excited to get to get into. Rema dropped a deluxe for Rays and Roses. Um, I thought it was interesting for a couple of reasons. First, he didn't do like most artists do where they just put all the song, all the new songs on the beginning or the end. He mixed it into the album, which made you more incentivized to listen to it top to bottom, which I thought was smart. I think they mixed a couple of songs up, too. I think they just kind of switched up the order which is, I think, an interesting way of refreshing the album. I think the deluxe is pretty play, not played out, but everybody does it the same, right? Like they just drop, they, they put the album, they put the two or three songs or the Lucy's on there, the remix at the end, and then they just call it a day. They don't really give it any effort, but I kind of like the way they spun this one. And uh, out of the three records he put on there, Hove was my favorite. I definitely go check this out if you're into Rema. Um, it's a pretty good project. And it's a good project to go back to. It was one of the better Afrobeats albums of last year um i'm pretty sure it came out the top of last year but of the last couple years it's been one of the best so i definitely go check that out victory and tempo dropped another remix to the hit that they put out soweto uh, featuring omale i heard this on i forget where i heard this leaked at i think it might have either been tiktok or twitter so when they initially dropped the first remix with rema and don toliver i was kind of mad because i like this version better if i'm being honest um, I think people do remixes, uh, they don't really give any effort into it. They just kind of send the song over, the artist sends over a verse, and just they kind of add it at the beginning or the end. And Omale's verse is better to me than the other remix that they did. So I'll definitely have this one in rotation. Um, G Herbal dropped Strictly From My Fans 2. I did not listen to the first one, I don't think. I'm not really sure. I don't really remember Strictly For My Fans 1. That might have been a while ago before I was really a big G Herbo fan, but I'm definitely going to give this one a listen. He had a couple features on there from, uh, I know one of them was Glorilla, and then he had a couple more on there. Drench, Mellow Bucks. Yeah, that's it. Glorilla, Drench, and Mellow Bucks. So I'm probably going to get around to it. I don't know if it's going to be today, but at some point I'm definitely going to give it a listen. I'm, I'm a big G Herbo fan. So we'll see how that one goes. He's been putting out a lot of music lately. Like he's almost at one a year, I feel like. And I feel like previous to this album, I felt like every album he was getting better with each project that he dropped. And I think uh, I said this earlier that his be his best beat selection on an album to me was 25. And then uh, this last album he put out was pretty good. He obviously got a lot more money for it in terms of the marketing dollars they put into it. Um, I knew that just from the, it's the second song on the album. I'll throw it up on the screen, but the one featuring Jeremiah, they sampled flashing lights. And just to get any type of Kanye sample, like you're going to have some, you're going to have to spend some dollars because most likely that song sampled a bunch of songs. So the clearance issues. So to get that much done, it just shows how much effort he put into that last project. But I'll definitely give this one a listen and we'll see where it stands in terms of his most recent album drops. Cause like I said, he's been on a lot of music recently. Jack Harlow announced a surprise project yesterday, um, Jackman. And this is where Tonio told me to mention something, but uh, he told me it was gonna be fire before it came out as soon as he seen the image. And he was right. I'm actually not surprised by how good he's rapping on this project. When he first came out and Antonio first introduced me to Jack Harlow, I felt like this is the type of music that he made. I, he, if you watch his progression, he was a very, he was a rapper's rapper. You know what I mean? Like bars were very important. And he has some poppy-ish records like Sundown and some other stuff from before What's Poppin'. But once What's Poppin' hit, he hit this, this sort of like mainstream success. And it sort of veered him off of the sound that he kind of grew up, not grew up on, but the sound that we were familiar with him from. And I've heard a lot of people talking about the project, but to me, it is most comparable, in my opinion, to 
Chomp by Russ, right? I usually don't talk about these two a lot, but Russ's approach to making a ton of different types of music is the reason that his fan base is so big and so wide and diverse in terms of the amount of demographics that he hits, like across different countries, across different genres. Um, and so for Jack Harlow to lean back into the like rapper's album, it shows that not all things, it shows that it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's always and, not or. Gary Vee says that a lot. And I agree with that. I think certain artists feel like they're getting pitted into certain rabbit holes or certain like silos when it comes to genres. Like, oh, this is a pop artist. Oh, this is an R&B artist. Oh, this is a rapper. But if you don't allow them to do that, and the way you don't allow them to do that is by giving them like a proof of concept of whatever you're talking about. So if you want to rap, if you want to make Spanish music, like whatever it is, as long as you give them that, people can't say that that's not what they want from you because it really doesn't matter. It's whatever you want to put out. I think a good example of this is Cal Yuchi's. Uh, I saw in an interview that she said that she was going to drop in English and it's, well, she dropped her last English, her last project in English and the next one's going to be in Spanish. And she said, she's going to try and keep doing that. And she likes pushing her pen that way. And I think that's really dope. And I think obviously it's going to give you a broader market to address to because there's people that won't listen to English music and there's people that won't listen to Spanish music, but you're able to hit both when a lot of people aren't. In terms of the actual music on the Jack Harlow project, the thing that I find most interesting about it or the thing I liked best about it was his beat selection. The first four beats to me are crazy. I saw one of them was by Hollywood Cole. I can give you the producers right now. Yeah. And that was, that was very surprising to me. I feel like he picked a great selection of people in terms of producers. So the initial one, Common Ground, which is a good song, produced by Angel, Babe, Truth, Lopez, J Soul, Mike, Mike Waves, and Nico. They Don't Love It, which is a great track, was produced by Hollywood Cole, that one's fire. Ambitious, which is produced by Wallace Lane. And then Is That I is produced by Hollywood Cole and Mario Luciano. I don't know a lot of these people. I haven't, like, I, I can't tell you what other songs that they've played. I'm definitely going to check them out and probably come back to you guys with some other stuff that they did. But the beats on here are crazy. And I do feel like Jack got off. Pause. Jack got off. That's crazy. But I think that this project is really dope. And I'm actually... This one to me is way better than the last one. And I'll definitely probably have this one in rotation for a minute. But I think it's interesting and I think it's dope that he's able to still go do that. You know what I mean? Like I talk about all the time, the fact that Russ drops chomp shows that he's a real rapper. And another big point I realized when just listening to this project is the reason why hip hop and rap sets itself apart from other genres or other art forms is because of the authenticity that comes that used to come with writing raps, right? Like everybody now doesn't really care if you write your own raps, but that used to be a thing back in the day with real hip hop heads and like MCs write their own raps. And it was kind of just an unspoken truth that people lived by for a while. And it didn't really like, I didn't really know why that held so much weight. Like it's obviously respect and like doing it yourself. But I think that after listening to this project and some of the things that he's talking about in here, like he's talking about some things with uh, his dad and his brother and like people he's had to disown or kind of like dissociate from because of things that they did. And it made me think about how one, like it gives you a, a view into the mind of Jack Harlow, right? Like there are certain records where they're so, like wide ranging and broad in terms of what he's talking about, or he's not really talking about anything of substance. And they make for good songs like a nail tech or like a first class, but they don't really tell you about the artists themselves. And so it doesn't really allow for that, that connection between the artist and the listener. But a rapper, I realized like listening to this, it's like, oh, I understand him in a different light now that he's speaking on things about himself. You know what I mean? And so when I think about hip hop and rap, I think why, I think about why that is such a staple, not only in just America, but just as a global thing and why it sort of like 
everybody has accepted hip hop and hip hop is culture is because it is equated with truth in a way. It is equated with authenticity in a way. I saw a video a little bit earlier of, t- of somebody talking about why hip hop blew up coming out of the civil rights movement. Like we had funk and then the sampling and then it turned into hip hop in the eighties and nineties. And they were saying that basically it was, it was the culture's reaction to nothing really changing, right? Like I've always said hip hop is the voice, is the voice of the voiceless. It's the people that aren't being spoken for given a microphone like by one artist or one person talking about what's going on in a specific community or what's going on in a specific demographic and sort of broadcasting it out to the rest of the world. And him saying that really, like I internalized that in a way that I hadn't really thought about that before. Like that couldn't have been, that's too close for it to be, that's too close for it to be a coincidence. Like civil rights is straight into hip hop. And so I think that that is why hip hop and rap is important in a way. It's just speaking on us, it's supposed to, or the good stuff or the timeless stuff speaks on us, speaks on some things in a way that a lot of people aren't able to articulate. And it sort of hits the masses in a way that maybe regular speeches or writing isn't able to because it's entertainment and it's art and more people are going to consume it. It's like I think about the song I think I really embodies that is All Right by Kendrick Lamar. Like it speaks about a message, but it hit a large demographic of people because it's music. You know what I mean? So, and it's crazy that I heard that and thought about that listening to Jack Carlo's album. Me and Tonio talk about what hip hop is today. And I would say it as a joke, but it's like there's truth in all, in all humor. And so I would say to him all the time that hip hop, Jack Harlow is hip hop now. Like for, for better or worse, for however, however you grew up on it, however it used to be, however you look at it now, Jack Harlow is what hip hop is today, or at least part of it. You know what I mean? And so for me to get that, that realization or think about why hip hop was important from listening to this Jack Harlow Lucy project that he kind of just threw out was kind of crazy to me. But I think it stands true for all types of hip hop all over the world. And we know hip hop is affecting like all other communities in like the UK, Africa, Asia, wherever you want to talk about. And I think that this is just a fact that stands true across all of it. So outside of that, I would definitely go give Jackman a listen if you like rap, hip hop. Like I said, the first five, there weren't really skips on here for me. It's a short project. I think it's like 20 some minutes. Yeah, it's not long. It's like 20 something minutes. And I would definitely give it a listen through. Like the first four songs are really, really dope. Well, five. I really like the first five. And then I like eight and nine too. And 10. I like all of them. I'm not going to lie. This is a good little project. But he's good for those. He's dropped a couple of these in the past. But if I had to pick one or two off of here that I really, really like, the intro, I grew up in the suburbs. The intro, Common Ground, made me think of so many people I grew up with in the suburbs. And how hip hop affects people out there and how they like sort of take on the characteristics of the stuff that comes out in the music and in the culture, but they're not really connected to it in that same way that either people who have family in it or people who are actually in it are actually connected to it. And so that song to me was the best one, if I'm being real, because it just really hit home with me and where I grew up with. Like I didn't grow up in inner city or in a really, really bad neighborhood. I grew up in the suburbs. And so you sort of see a mix of everything when you're out there. And I think he really hit it on the nail with that song. Another another surprise that came out this week for me, somebody I was very unfamiliar with, if I'm being honest, is Stoneboy. He dropped his project, his album, Fifth Dimension. Um, I have a lot to say about this project, surprisingly, because I didn't even know it was coming out until um, Release Radar for Spotify put the Stoneboy Stormzy song, the Stoneboy Stormzy song in the playlist. And so I clicked on it. I gave a listen. And one, anytime Stormzy does a feature, I'm going to go listen. Stormzy is one of my favorite rappers, period. And so, and because he has no real social uh, footprint and you really only get the album when he drop, he pops out every three or four years. Whenever he drops a feature, I'm going to go listen just to see what he says. And whoever he decides to give that feature to or associate with, I'm going to check their music out as well. So when I saw the song, I really liked it. The song was called, the song was called Life and Money. Um, I really liked it. I enjoyed it. But 
what really surprised me about this project is that it's a dance hall inspired album, right? Stoneboy is from Ghana and he's making a lot of dance hall records. I'm just gonna run down some of the features on here for you and then tell you why I think that's important or why I really enjoy seeing it this way. So you got Stormzy, Tiwa Savage, Dexter Daps, Mareba, Jax Karras, DeVito, Shaggy, DJ Maforisa, DJ Maforisa, Angelique, Kid Joe, and then I don't want to mess this name up, Oxlade. So there's a lot of African artists on there. And then there's uh, Shaggy and Dex Adapts who are Caribbean artists on there. And so I had to go do some research on who Stoneboy was and sort of what he had going on because I was really surprised to see a Ghanaian act doing a primarily dance hall sound. It made it reminded me of how Stefan Don has Caribbean parents, but she grew up in Europe and she associates a lot with a lot of African acts now, or she does a lot of features or things like that with DJs and stuff like that in Africa, which is really, that's really dope to see to me. And so I wanted to do some research and I watched this interview with uh, on Hot 97, Ebro in the Morning with Stoneboy and Ebro. And then I thought that interview was so good. They talked a lot about the relation between Ghana and Jamaica, which I really didn't really know about. Um, they talk about his influences and who he was listening to growing up. They also talked a lot about just the connection between the diaspora as a whole and why Africa and why Afrobeats being a big player in music going forward, or what I think is going to be the number one genre in the world moving forward, and what that does for not just Africans, but not just African born Africans, that's just African descended people everywhere. Afrobeat is a very, a very, a very significant example of where we're headed as a people. The diaspora, all of us. So this is this is this has brought all of us together. Reggae would have led, maybe even journeys that began before. I'm just speaking my, my time. Mm -hmm. You know, reggae, dance, or soca, over in the diaspora has been paving the way and representing for us as Africans from home too. Yeah. And so this time, we've also been able to push through so much so that we're now connecting the bridges. Like, it's a beautiful time to be alive because when you take an Afrobeat record, you can find all of us in there. From dance, or to soca, to R&B, to reggae. And to hear that from him and like the way he was able to articulate the connections between places and how the sounds of dancehall and soca and the Caribbean and reggae were all influenced from Africa, right? Like there's a, there's a, a direct connection that people can point to and identify with and giving a name to it and like sort of educating people about that. That was so, to me, is really profound and it's important because I think one of my primary missions with this platform and with the brand is to find ways to connect people across the diaspora and show people how we're more alike than different. And so hearing this conversation with Ebro, it really gave me a type of respect for him that I, I mean, how much can you really respect a media personality from somebody you don't know? But to be able to like shed light on that and always like give reference to Africa in the way that he does, I really like seeing that. So I'm gonna go look for more content of his in relation to Africa. And then I'm definitely gonna actually listen to Stone Boy's music a lot more. I got through the project about halfway through. Um, this just came out yesterday. So I'm definitely gonna give it a full listen and then go back in his catalog from before. But I think it's important, like this type of music being pushed to the front, you know what I mean? I don't know how, I don't know, I'm still iffy about Universal eating up all the market share all over the world, you know, like um, he's he's been signed with Universal for a minute, but they, they just like signed him through Def Jam in the Americas, I think he said, but Stormzy signed through there and there's a whole list of acts who are coming out of Africa and Europe that are signing with Universal. And I'm hoping we're just not doing the same thing all over again in every other place. You know, I think there's so much market being created, which I'm going to get into later with Spotify, but it like 
they're they're monopolies and i don't i wonder how you like you break these monopolies up they own everything and so they're going to be in every market so that's definitely something i'm interested in from a business or like an enterprise perspective but the music together i think is important for it to get out there so if you have time definitely go check out fifth dimension by stone boy now let's get into some to some other topics that i've been wanting to talk about um Okay, Spotify and market penetration. So Music Business Worldwide put out this article saying, and the title of it is, Spotify needs to woo boomers if it wants to keep growing in the US market. Spotify and some other music streaming platforms have enjoyed tremendous growth in the US in recent years, but the growth is now likely to start slowing as annual increases in subscribers inevitably decelerate in the market. So I'm going to put the, the chart up on the screen, but last year it went up 8 million compared to 2021. Before that, it was 8.5. And before that, it was 15. This is in millions, right? And so these are, these are the number of subscribers. And so it, the article goes on to essentially talk about how they're reaching the top of um, the top of the population in America in certain demographics. So in a survey carried out in January of 2023, based on the National Telephone Survey of 1,500 people, Edison found that 75% of respondents in the US said that they had listened to some online audio in the past month. However, among, uh, however, among respondents aged 55 and above, that figure stood at just 53%. That compared to 89% of 12 to 34 year olds which is a big market and 85% of 35 to 54 year olds. Ba so basically the article is essentially just saying that there's a huge, uh, there's a, there's an opportunity with older baby boomers in terms of online streaming. And I think as a, like as a business, the most important thing when it comes to your customer, like you have to think about the important things, right? Like when it comes to acquiring customers, it's do you stay in the same market or go to new markets? And then if you're trying to increase revenue, it's how many more new people can we get or how can we charge people more, right? And the reason that the US is the primary market or one of the biggest market, it is the biggest market, is because we have the biggest buying power, right? So they're going to keep going into this market as far as they can because we have a lot more buying power than a lot of other places. But I think as a business, I think it's important to look into new markets, right? And they're basically trying to squeeze this lemon for as much as they possibly can. And I think a lot of that has to do with the infrastructure in a lot of other places. I talk a lot about how Africa's primary and secondary industries are not built up yet. And entertainment comes after a lot of those, right? So a lot of these places in Africa, which is where we're focused right now, a lot of the places in Africa don't have internet. So if I don't have internet, I can't stream any online audio. So if that's the case, I can't even purchase your product. I don't even have the availability to purchase it or use it. And it'll be interesting to see how those markets are built up. But I think by not really giving a lot of focus to those markets, it allows for new players to get into play and gain market share and gain capital. And then they become players on a global scale. And so there's a um, so there's other music streaming platforms in Africa right now that are way larger than Spotify is, and I think that's because their understanding of the actual market is a lot different. Like I remember reading about I think it was Boomplay. I'm looking it up right now, but it might have been Boomplay, and they were they had a partnership. They either had a partnership or they were the same company that made a lot of phones in Africa. And so a lot of the phones already came, a lot of the phones already came installed with that music player on there. Yeah, it was Boomplay. Yeah. Boomplay is number one. And then you got Audio Mac, which is also a really good platform. Um, Songa. There's a couple of them on here, actually. Some of them I haven't heard of. But for that to be the case, as a business, you have to wonder, like, how sustainable is this? I'm pretty sure Spotify has been losing money 
Spotify has not made a full year profit. Has, Spotify has not made a full net profit since being founded in 2006. That's actually a fucking insane stat. So I wonder in terms of the streaming business model, how are you like, if this is one of the biggest players in the world and they haven't been able to make a profit and their business plan is to go after boomers, I guess, to really make that a prime, that if that is a primary target of theirs, it makes me wonder when will they hit profit? How do they hit profit? Like it turns, it seems like the costs are not, it's not a cost, like for it to be 2006 since you hit a profit, Wait, to not have a full year net profit ever? Like, how do you make that a sustainable business? How does that not collapse or get bought out by somebody? I think Apple Apple Music is in a different place than Spotify because it's a supplementary portion of their business, right? Like Apple's primary goal is not the music, it's a phone. So the music is a feature on their primary products. So it makes me wonder like how sustainable is Spotify's business model and how long until we see them not be relevant anymore because what what goes up must come down and they're not even they're up in terms of revenue but they're not up in terms of profit so it makes me wonder like how long is spotify going to be around i just hope they i hope that people are really understanding that you know what i mean like that a lot of these markets that don't have the primary and secondary i guess that's another issue right like if you're in the business of making money in music it's not really your job to worry about other people's problems in relation to you in that way, right? Like you're just worried about people who can buy your product. So maybe it's not their problem, but I also just found that interesting. Like, is Spotify gonna be able to grow enough to make a profit to be a sustainable business? I don't know. Sony Music reportedly in talks to buy stake in Bad Bunny's label in Bad Bunny's label and management firm Remus. Spotify Music Corp is reportedly in advanced talks to assist in the buyout of a majority stake and Latin music superstar Bad Bunny's music label and management company, Remus Entertainment. That's according to Billboard, which reported on Friday, April 21st, citing sources familiar with the manner that Bad Bunny manager and Remus CEO, Noah Saad, who is one of the power players on Billboard, and he's a very good exec in terms of what he's been able to accomplish in the Latin music market. They're the biggest player. Um, they're going to assist Remus CEO Noah Assad in buying out his partner, Rafael Ricardo Jimenez Dan, a former Venezuelan government official who has a 60% majority stake in the company. Sony reported, Sony will reportedly join in the buyout of the stake held by Jimenez, who has not been involved in the day to day operations of Remus since 2018, Billboard said. So it basically goes on to talk about how Sony's going to be a player in their management label and in the actual, uh, and in the music label. And so the management label, they manage Archangel, Eladio, Carion, Jao, oh my God, I need to refresh my Spanish, uh, Yawel, Irandi, and then Tommy Torres. Um, they're up to a hundred employees and they just launched a sports division called Rima Sports, and they're going to have a bunch of MLB players, which I think is an interesting angle for them to go. But essentially, if they're able to go through with this on Sony Markets, uh, on Sony Market side, they're going to assign that ownership stake to Orchard, which is a publishing division of Sony. And if I'm not mistaken, the publishing agreement between Bad Bunny and Orchard was a 90-10. And so basically they were only getting 10% of his publishing, but to buy into the label, they're just trying to get as much of that as possible. Like if you have an artist who's able to almost generate half a billion dollars, 400, like $400 million in revenue and ticket sales and lead in streaming for as long as he was able to, he's the biggest artist in the world. And so if I'm able to buy into the label that he's on, I'm going to do it. So this was an interesting play to me. Obviously I, I like the businesses are going to do their thing. Like that's why they're so big. The only reason they're able to get to the point they're at is because they're looking for opportunities like this. So I definitely think um, it'll be interesting to see how the label builds out, but I don't know. I thought it was an interesting headline to cover. This one was just kind of funny to me because I am one of these people. So 50% of vinyl owners don't own a record player. 
Yeah. So this article about music business online, I found a lot of stuff on music business online, but they're just talking about the increase in vinyl sales as opposed to the increase in actual record players. And I thought this was funny when I read it because I own one record, right? Like I had somebody who made this record for me and I've been meaning to get a record player. Like I just moved into this place and that was going to be one of the last things that I got. And so I thought it was funny when they were saying that there were so many people who have records with no record players because I am one of those people. But I will I will get one at some point. But I think um I think records are interesting because they're almost their their art, right? Like I think that brings the music into like a physical space in that way. Um I know people talk about how that you hang up art you hang up art on the walls and they just sort of become conversation pieces for a lot of people. So like when people come over, they put them up and you're like, oh, what's that? Or who painted that? Or I kind of like that. You guys just kind of talk about it. And I think people are using uh, vinyls in the same way. And I thought about vinyls for a minute because a family member of mine died last year, the year before that. It was a so- semi-distant family member. And we were cleaning out their U-Haul truck. I mean, their U-Haul storage facility. And we just seen all of his rec- He had a ton of records in there. And I got to look them up on Spotify. And whether I like the music or not of that person is irrelevant. It was just interesting to see the combination of a collection, Mm -hmm. like the collection that he had, right? And to see the type of different music Mm -hmm. tastes that he was into. And it made me think about my own life. Like if I was was dead and I had family members cleaning out my stuff or even as I got older, because I have a couple of friends who gave their, whose grandparents gave them their record collection. And I'm like, yo, if I could give off my record collection or I had one, that would be so dope to sort of curate your music sense in a way, in a physical way that, like in a physical sense. Um, I know we're obviously going to have streaming and music and it's all on our phones now, but to bring it out like that makes, I don't know, it makes it more tangible. And I think that would be a cool collection to pa- either pass on or for people to look at someday. So I'm definitely going to get into record co- collecting, but... I just thought it was funny that half of the people that don't have, like have records, don't have record players. So Um, I think that was pretty much it for this week. I think I covered everything that I was interested in, you know, um, I'm, I'm glad that a lot of music dropped this weekend. I'll be out this weekend, probably out of town. We'll see what happens, but this weekend I'm going to get a couch. The setup's going to keep changing. I don't know where I'm going. I might be over there next week. I might be over here next week. Um, hopefully next week, Tony will be back, you know, Tony will moving and grooving right now. He in the Bahamas. Uh, like I said, we got pictures and stuff like that. He's out there having a great time, but, uh, I love traveling and I, I'm glad that he's traveling more. You know, we have a lot planned for this year, um, with the brand and without the brand. And I'm glad to get to places and hopefully get into the music scenes there. Like I'm really excited to go to Africa this year. I'm really excited to go to London this year. I'm going to Jamaica in June. So these are places I definitely want to touch for just personal reasons. Like they're great places to go, but also I think there's opportunities to touch base with music people there. And um, I'm hopefully going to try and make that happen. We'll see about Africa. I've been thinking about Nigeria, but watching that stone boy interview made me think about Ghana in a different way. So um, this has been episode five of the real rhythms and Ron's podcast. I'm still finding my way through this, you know, like, podcasting is an interesting thing. Broadcasting is interesting. I'm trying not to rush myself and try and find my groove and figure it out. But the only way to do that is to just continue to show up.